segue to continue at once with the next musical selection or composition. Segue to make a transition directly from one section or theme segue, to another. To move smoothly and unhesitatingly from one state, situation, condition, or element to another. Segue to perform in the manner of the preceding section. Segue to make a transition from one thing to another smoothly and without interruption. This is Segue with Dean Aldemaro Romero, a weekly program exploring the lives and work of the people of the College of Arts and Sciences at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Hello, everybody. Dr. Allison Thomason was born in Riverside, California. She obtained a bachelor's in all world archaeology and art from Brown University in Rhode Island, a master's in Near Eastern languages and civilizations from the University of Chicago, and a doctorate in history in art, archaeology, and history from Columbia University in New York. Today, she is a professor in the Department of Historical Studies at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Welcome to Segway, Dr. Thomason. Thank you, Dean Romero. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, well, obviously, you work in something that sounds very interesting, but one wonders in those people who start early in their careers being showing that interest in a particular subject, how come do you become interested in the history of art in general? Well, um, it, I guess it started with, with my middle school social studies <laughs> teachers, mm -hmm. and they sort of got me interested. That's when you study world history. You begin to study it. And, um, and then I got to excavate in my undergraduate career, and that's when I fell in love with objects and material culture. Mm -hmm. And you can approach material culture from a number of different ways. Um, but I realized I especially enjoyed a um, particular uh, group of artworks from uh, around 900 BC in Mesopotamia. And I love looking at them. And there's the, these are the uh, Neo-Assyrian reliefs. Mm -hmm. And um, they're just incredibly detailed and have so much information and interesting scenes that that just I'd say in my junior year of college, I went abroad to study abroad in England, and I was able to look at the reliefs in the British Museum close up, and I just I fell in love with that topic. And so I pursued it, pursued it into my master's at Chicago and then um, into my Ph.D. at Columbia. And I kind of shifted from a language focus into a more art history focus as I did so. Now, it sounds like basically you were in the intersection of three different areas. Yes. Archaeology, history, and art. Right. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, I was wondering if that probably re, re, means more work for you in terms of trying to um, read more stuff or well, different areas. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's absolutely necessary when you study especially ancient history. Mm -hmm. um, I am sort of the ancient historian here in the Department of His Historical Studies at SIUE. So I have to cover Egypt, Mesopotamia, Greece, Rome, and all points in between. Um, but there are time periods in that whole range of places and spaces where we don't have written documents. So you have to understand the tools of art history to be able to analyze objects. And by all means, you have to understand uh, archaeological artifacts and how excavations work. Um, in order to understand where the objects you're studying are coming out of. Mm -hmm. So it's absolutely essential. Now, having said that, y you kind of get stuck because so the people who are textual specialists in my field are sort of like, well, you didn't take enough language. And the people who are the art history specialists <laughs> are like, well, we're happy, we're happy here because my PhD is in art history. Uh, and the archaeologists are sort of like, well, we like to look at pottery, not pretty things necessarily. Uh -huh. So, uh, you know, you either please them all with your interesting interdisciplinary perspective or you yes. get others to say, huh. Now, art has been with human civilization from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And although we know that some animals like uh, some Elephants, mammals uh, yeah. can use some tools, mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is when you think about the paintings in the Altamira Cave in mm -hmm. Spain, for example, mm -hmm. and other places and some of the early uh, artifacts, would you say that art is a feature that is unique, really, to humans? It's something that defines us as a civilization. I, s I think certainly symbolic thinking, yeah, and, and the sort of um, one step further of ab abstraction that art takes, for sure. 
Uh, so the earliest art did include um, some figures of animals from the, the cave paintings and figurines, too, carved mm-hmm. from stone and antler and things. But then um, there were periods when in early, early, say, Mesopotamian history when there was just a lot of geometric motifs on pottery and things. And there's some sort of abstract symbolic thought going on there. It's not just decoration for the sake of decoration, I think. So um, I think that step is what makes us very, very human. And, and again, it's not just in my area of the world, the Near East, the Middle East, but all over the world where you see this parallel development of um, thinking about art and symbolic thinking. You explained earlier how come you became interested Mm-hmm. in this particular subject, but mm-hmm. why the Middle East? Why the geographic part yeah. of the world? Yeah, well, the more I learned about it, when I started taking courses in college. My freshman year, I had a, a, a course on Near Eastern or Old World archaeology, mm-hmm. it's sometimes called. And I realized everything happened there earliest <laughs> yeah. and bigger at other, you know, so it was a little bit of a competitive game for me. I wanted to go, well, well, if that's happening in the first millennium, well, what happened in the second before that B.C. and the third? And how did it all start to begin with? And I just thought I was just so amazed by the development and complexity of the Mesopotamian and Near Eastern civilizations at such an early, early, early time period in history, the pre-classical even. Yeah. You know, I thought, well, the Greeks and Romans, they got it all from the Near East. Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to study the Near East. Yeah. Now, the Mesopotamian uh, area... Uh, has been called the cradle of civilization. Mm-hmm. And I think for more than one reason, mm-hmm. not only because of the art that you have studied, but also it's because that was the area in the world where we see the first examples of domestication of plants and animals. Yes. Would you say that the two things go together, the ability of humans to exploit nature and no nature, but at the same time to generate art? Well, I always, and and I'm not alone in this, but I learned in graduate school and and beyond that the ability of humans to produce their own food, that is, where they had a food surplus, allowed the kind of labor uh, specialization that could come with, say, a potter now, someone not having to farm could now do pottery uh, and become a specialist in pottery. So it's an old, old theory, but it's one that I kind of have stuck too, and, and, and that's how I sort of, at least at the undergraduate level, try to explain to students why here in the Middle East, why at the same time? Or, you know, but honestly, those experiments with early agriculture and food production took thousands of years, and they were just experiments. But I think that that allowed uh, societies to increase their population for one, and then for two, to uh, have basically specialists develop in other uh, labor occupations besides farming. So the thinkers became the religious specialists. Mm -hmm. Uh, The people who could organize people, as I explained to my students, became the political specialists. The um, potters or the the artists became the pottery specialists or the sculpture specialists. Mm So um, that's how I always understood it and envisioned it. And In general, I think the archaeological evidence fits that because the sites where we see the fluorescence of so-called complex civilization, um, food production was well developed by then. So I think archaeologically that you have food production preceding this fluorescence of complex civilization, which occurs in um, Syria and southern Iraq around as early as, you know, 3500 BCE. They're pushing the date back, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, that's when I, that's how I always understood it, that you had to have food production before you had all the other stuff. Okay. Now, you just mentioned Syria and Iraq. And yeah. Obviously, these countries are in the news now because of what's going on with ISIS. And before that, we saw the, the two wars in, in Iraq, and we saw also what was going on with the Taliban in, in Afghanistan. Mm. And something that is mentioned from time to time in the news, although I don't think as prominent as it should be, is the destruction of archaeological and artistic artifacts Mm -hmm. in these countries by Mm -hmm. religious zealots or whatever you want to call them. I was wondering to what extent do we know that we're losing our archaeological memory, our artistic memory, Mm -hmm. uh, due to these conflicts? We actually know a lot about this because we um, have 
there's a, a tremendous amount of satellite data, satellite imagery of the Middle East right now, of Syria and, and Iraq. And there has been now for two decades when we've had this military focus there in the U.S. So archaeologists are using satellite images to demonstrate what an excavation site looked like before the security situations broke down and after. And the, some of the sites in southern Iraq and Syria now are pockmarked with uh, holes dug by illegal uh, robbers, basically. Mm -hmm. And what's happening is there's a whole network of middlemen who the local people sell objects to, uh, and the middlemen are selling to collectors, especially in Europe and Asia. Uh, so it's not just what's happening on the ground in Iraq, but there's a whole down-the-line process that archaeologists pay attention to. So they try to see when objects come up for auction, what's their, do they have a solid provenance? Um, now, having said that, for, for all archaeologists I know who worked in the Middle East, work in the Middle East, you know, the, the, the humans, the people that we work with are paramount in our minds. Um, the people who excavate with us, who, who secure and watch the site when we're not digging, because you don't dig around, you usually dig in the um, summer or winter, depending on which country you're in. And so that's always paramount for archaeologists. But also, they're interested in getting information on the ground. And often archaeologists, because they keep in touch with their local personnel who they hire on the excavations, they often know very much what's going on on the ground, mm -hmm. even more so than, of course, our national news media does. Now, you mentioned that some of those artifacts are being sold in Europe. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering <coughs> if the European countries are really taking measures to monitor and stop any illegal trade of these artifacts. Yeah, I mean, there there's a, a law, a sort of international code put into effect by UNESCO, dates to about 1973 four that 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 illegal antiquities, that is, things excavated b before or after 74, are are not – how can I put this? They're not allowed on the market unless the home country approves, mm -hmm. right? And even then, I think. So th I know that um, archaeologists have worked with uh, UNESCO, to be sure, Interpol, uh, the FBI, the Army, to try to stop – the looting of sites and the um, transport across borders of artifacts, but it's of course these borders are very porous, as we well know. So it's it's tough, and there aren't always archaeologists um, well placed within these international organizations to be sort of immediate advisors. But I do know many of many of my colleagues get called upon by the international organizations. For example, if a, a hoard is confiscated by someone flying in somewhere at an airport, they'll call the archaeologists out or show pictures, you know, is what do you think this is? Oh, well, I think this was illegally excavated from, you know, X, Y, Z. So now having also said that, some of our professional organiz organizations such as um, the AIA, the Archaeological Institute of America, and the one I'm really involved in, the American Schools of Oriental Research, are uh, – working with the State Department to establish cultural heri heritage preservation and assessment initiatives. Mm -hmm. um, there's a big one now that ASOR is getting involved in called the Syrian Heritage Initiative, and John Kerry just gave a speech mentioning it. And, um, you know, the State Department works in consort with uh, academic archaeologists to try to identify sites that are being looted, artifacts that have been looted, and to try to somehow work with local people to help prevent it. And that usually involves working with state antiquities um, boards or uh, groups in Syria or Iraq. And, of course, politically, that's a fraught situation. A potato right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Now, you mentioned UNESCO, which is the mm -hmm. um, part of the United Nations that deals with cultural issues and mm -hmm. everything else. Mm -hmm. But the United States withdrew the support, the support to UNESCO a few years ago because of issues with Israel. Yeah. And I was wondering if that lack of support to UNESCO somehow is hampering that kind of efforts. Uh, I'd say no. I think I, I feel like the State Department, whatever we officially signed on to, they're still really trying to support cultural heritage uh, preservation in the war zones that we're in, that the U.S. is involved in. Um, 
but a, a lot of times they're doing that under pressure from professional archaeological organizations and other people. Um, I, I think that was certainly the case in 2003 when there was a big uproar that the Iraq Museum in Baghdad was looted. And tremendous pressure came from archaeological societies and organizations. And I think that pressure has an effect, believe it or not. And now the idea is to include archaeologists in any kind of pre-planning. Um, but I, I think the United States basically holds to the tenet of UNESCO and tries to enforce it at the borders, depending on what country you're talking about, too. I, I'm not sure. I don't know the legal details. Mm -hmm. And I do have lots of colleagues in, who are experts in the legalities of UNESCO. But um, I think the uh, impetus is there. You know, I don't think the State Department ignores okay. it in any stretch of the imagination. Now, the U.S. has had troops in that part of the world now for a long time. Yeah. And I was wondering if there has been any instances in which the, the U.S. military has been involved in any way in illegal trading of uh, artifacts? Um, I wouldn't be able to speak to that because, the, you know, I only see what comes out in the media, you know, so I, I, I wouldn't be able to speak to that. But what I would be able to speak to are my veteran students who've come back from Iraq mm -hmm. and Afghanistan. And I say to them, what did you see? You know, did you see any artifacts? Do you see any sites? Because they're in my Mesopotamia class. They They would know what a site would look like and and they're like, ma'am, we were just kind of on the base. <laughs> um, so I don't really know much about that in because terms I, of I haven't, I haven't read U.S. military else. personnel. Yeah, I mean, there was a big, big splash with the early Iraq Museum looting and how yeah. much the folks there, the, the U.S. military didn't, tried to— They didn't do anything initially, right? I mean, well, it's, it's a very complicated. There have been like about— 10 books written about that situation. Mm -hmm. um, and the U.S. military had a, a classic, classicist who also happened to be an officer investigate what mm -hmm. happened shortly mm -hmm. after, and he had a book. And um, But for the most part, the archaeologists that are involved with the professional organizations, the professional organizations have set up training programs with military bases to try to help educate uh, troops before they go abroad. If you see this uh, this uh, a cuneiform tablet and someone tries to sell it to you or something, you know, you can't buy it and you have to report that, mm -hmm. right? Um, or a coin or something, a bronze mm -hmm. coin. So actually, I think now there's there is integration with between the archaeologists and the military to kind of really put that out of anybody's minds. Now, I can't say if it's... But by looking in the truth. Yeah. For example, I know that when, when, when in 2003, when the military was sort of trying to flush out Saddam Hussein, they had the famous card packs of Saddam's regime and yeah. his close allies. They also had a card pack, playing cards. In fact, I have a copy. I should have brought it. That they were handing out to soldiers that showed them examples of famous artifacts or artifact types from Mesopotamia. So there is that integration. It is happening. Um, it, it happened a little kind of after the fact, after 2003. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, well, reading your resume, uh, I read that you had published a book titled Luxury and Legitimation, Royal mm -hmm. Collecting in Ancient Mesopotamia. Mm -hmm. Tell us what this book is all about. Yeah, I published this. Um, I was interested in finding out about uh, ancient Mesopotamian practices of collecting objects, collecting artifacts, and what Mesopotamians thought about art and objects. And I studied texts, images, buildings, and I discovered that the Mesopotamians were some of the first people to have um, botanical gardens, mm -hmm. zoological gardens, and indeed perhaps even sort of museums where they displayed heirloom objects. The purposes for this are very different from today, where we have a very educational mission with our public collections, I think. But the Mesopotamians, I think the education was to let people know how legitimate their kings were. Uh, and that would have been a way of educating their public, so to speak. Uh, so there are always royal collections that we know about. But they had whole libraries, too, of ancient tablets that they curated and kept. Yeah. So there's a whole lot of evidence of that curation and collecting. 
Another area that you have studied <coughs> is the role played by women yes. in the production of art. And this is interesting because the impression that most people have is because that part of the of the world, because religion and mm -hmm. other circumstances, mm -hmm. women are considered very low in the, in the yeah. socialist case. But you have actually discovered that they did play a major role in the production of art. Uh, yeah, especially textiles. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The women were the, the textile weavers, for sure. Um, mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, these textiles don't get archaeologically preserved for us in the climate of the Middle East very well, except for Egypt. So we learn about textile weavers and production and um, really the textile economy market from texts and images. So I've done a, an article entitled Her Share of the Pro Profits about female textile entrepreneurs in one part of Mesopotamia. Actually, they were involved with textile trade to Anatolia, to Turkey. Mm -hmm. um, but th this to me was a very text-oriented text article. And um, I published it in a sort of textile anthology, an edited volume. And it was more textual than I've ever gone. And um, I, I did it because I had, when I got to SIUE, I didn't have any interest in gender or women. I really didn't. I was studying those kings, you know. And then uh, my colleagues here were, of course, stellar at gender history and studying uh, women's history. Um, and they influenced me to sort of think about this. And then I sort of I saw a kind of glaring historiographic uh, gap that a lot of people had talked about these text these women weaving textiles as supporting their family firms and helping their husbands. I said, what do you mean? They're, they're the production. They're controlling the business here. And we mm -hmm. had textual evidence. So I tried to give agency to those women more than as just sort of harping and complaining and supportive. I tried to show you that they were actually rhetorically in charge. <laughs> in all the years that you have been uh, doing research, I was wondering what has been the piece or the pieces that you have found or you have studied that have attracted the most attention from your part, and why? Um, yeah, well, I go back to my dissertation research at Columbia and actually in London as well at the British Museum and the British School of Archaeology in Iraq. These little um, ivory carvings, they were made out of elephant ivory, and they were little plaques and inlays and little miniature boxes that were um, uh, inlaid into furniture, wooden furniture. Mm -hmm. And while the wood didn't survive... We have all of the plaques because ivory survives quite well, even if it's burnt. And they're carved with amazing images. And they were collected by kings. And I, I, I'll never forget, I was sitting in my junior year abroad, sitting in the office of the, one of the most preeminent archaeologists of Mesopotamia, Max Malawan. And he had deceased. He was deceased, but in his office were still his books and some of the artifacts he'd excavated um, because it was the British School of Archaeology, too. And... One of my professors, who was his student, pulled up in a drawer, and there are all these amazing ivory artifacts. And she actually let us, and thank goodness, Dr. Herman, Professor Herman, she she let us touch them. Mm -hmm. And that tactile sense, that, that smooth feel, they were almost luminescent to me. And even today when I see those, there are hundreds of ivories. But even mm -hmm. today I, 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 I fetishize them, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they say about our disorients. We fetishize our objects. But I, they still just draw me in, and, and I can't touch them now because they're in museums. But, okay. but I love them. Now, you have written all, a lot about what is called portable art. Yes. That's and I, 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 mm -hmm. I would like to ask you if you can explain to our audience what do you mean by yeah. that. Yeah. So in Mesopotamia, you know, in, in Western art historical traditions, there's this con concept that we have high art and we have crafts. And that the high art is usually paintings and sculpture, and crafts are things like textiles or pottery or mm -hmm. even ornamental parts of buildings or metalwork. And in Mesopotamia, such a distinction didn't exist. That's a later Western concept. So in Mesopotamia, there is a different relative value placed on objects, and it had nothing to do with their size or their material or whether they have actually carved narrative figures on them or not. It had to do with uh, Mesopotamian concepts of, of, of things that had impact. And in Mesopotamia, for example, an object that was extremely shiny or dark was as powerful, no matter how large or small, as a huge object that wasn't, right? So when you look into Mesopotamian concepts of aesthetics, and I'm not the one who did that initially, my, my 
mentors and colleagues did, you see that they had no distinction between what was art and what wasn't art. I mean, everything was could have potentially impact, and impact on you physically as well as on your psyche and mm-hmm. your emotions, I think. Mm-hmm. And the same thing can be said about clothing because mm-hmm. uh, that's something you have also studied. Mm-hmm. So I was wondering to what extent that type of production also have a artistic value in addition right. to the utilitarian one. Right. Well, we know that um, when the Mesopotamians de- de- depicted figures clothed, they often included the details of weavings and embroidery and and even little metal things that were, especially in the, Mes- the Assyrian art of the first millennium B.C., mm-hmm. So we know that that mattered to them to show those details, to show the text, textile work, art, if you mm-hmm. want to call it. Um, so what what had been happening is, is people would call painting and sculpture, even in Mesopotamia, high art or major arts, mm-hmm. monumental art. And they'd call everything else minor art or decorative. And it was a bit of a pejorative term. And it's still being rattled about. And it's based on Western concepts of art, not Mesopotamian. So I proposed recently that we should call objects portable or non-portable based on how they were used in Mesopotamia, Mm -hmm. right? So textiles are portable. Small vessels are portable. Obviously, big stone reliefs that are life-size are not portable. So Mm -hmm. I propose that, and I don't know if it'll work. But it's more of a – that was more of a historiographic comment that Mm -hmm. I made in that article than, than anything else, I think. Okay. Well, in the minute that we have left, yes. I wanted to ask you, what, is, what project are you working on right now? What's your big dream right now? Right. So I just got done with a sabbatical in the spring, and I have to say they are amazing sabbaticals because they really do allow you to think and think differently. And so I now have turned – I want one of the things I was interested in textiles was how did the textiles feel against the skin of people in Mesopotamia? Do they comment upon that? Do they notice mm-hmm. it? Do they notice different textures? And that led me to study um, the archaeology of the senses in Mesopotamia, and that's what my sabbatical project turned out to be on. And I recently just submitted an article about that. So not only, you know, what was it like to see Mesopotamian works, monumental works or minor works? What was it like to be a Mesopotamian? I've always wanted to study that. I think that's what archaeologists do. What was it like to live back then? That's what we want to do. Yeah. We want to know. So, but what was it, what did it feel like? And so I've embarked on this um, ar- archaeology of the census for Mesopotamia. And uh, again, I'm influenced by other people who are doing the same for other parts of the world. So, well, thank you very much to Dr. Uh, Alison Thomason for this very interesting uh, yeah. uh, conversation about history and. Next week, we're going to have Professor Joe Page of the Department of Art and Design, who will be talking about the magic of ceramics. So stay tuned. This has been Segway with Dean Aldemaro Romero, a production of the Department of Mass Communications at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. All rights reserved, 2014. Thank you.